our dear viewers and listeners. We greet you in the precious and mighty name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yet again, this is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. As we open up today's session, let's dedicate this moment to God with the word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the great and awesome things you do in our lives. We are privileged for these moments you've given us, Heavenly Father, that through us you're communicating your message, the heart that you have towards the world, King of Glory, that many come to the knowledge of truth and to the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. Even today, Lord, we open up that you might feel us, that you might have your way, that through us you might touch the billions, the millions everywhere all over the world. That this knowledge might flood the whole earth in the name of Jesus. And so we are grateful, King of Glory. Have your way, precious Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ we've prayed. Amen. Amen. As we begin today's Bible study. I want us to reflect on two kinds of lifestyles. We have the lifestyle of the people who are disciplined in nature. The kind who move by a certain order. They will not go shopping before they have drawn up the budget. They will not spend spend beyond this budget. When they wake up in a day, they have objectives, they have goals to achieve for a particular day. And at the end of the day, they do a tick back on what has been achieved and what has not been fulfilled that day. Bottom line, they move their lives, they order their lives according to plan. Now we have a, another category of people. Theirs is a carefree life. Their life is almost random. They wake up and whatever comes their way is what they take in. When you look at both circumstances, the planned and the random, sometimes you get to wonder whether there is any plan actually going on, especially with the one that is has the random lifestyle. But I want you to understand something. That whether the circumstances are random or planned, the bottom line is that everything is happening according to God's plan. And that is the key message I want you to have at the back of your mind that there is a plan overarching plan above everything else that is being ordered here. And at the end of the day, that plan has got to be executed. Now, I want you to remember a certain point as we go along. It is something that I have talked over and over since we began this text of this series of revelation. That we are being shown these earthly sins. But they are being shown from a heavenly point of view. In chapter 4 of the book of Revelation, we see John being caught up into heaven. And he is now being revealed what is to happen. Now the sins that we see, especially from chapter 4 to chapter 19, are the things that are going to happen. 
But we see these earthly events from a heavenly point of view. Now, in heaven, it is a place where time is never a factor. You see, man perceives in their senses in three dimensions. All everything that we do comes down to just three states. Matter, time, and space. Nebanga. So everything we perceive with our senses is captured within those very three dimensions. And often we get caught when we are trying to get heavenly events and place them in time. These events we don't see them as when they happen. Here heaven is trying to show up us what happens. It does not show us when it happens. No wonder Peter explains to us that to God one day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years like one day. Now, this does not mean that you get days and then count them as years. What he wants you to get home is that in heaven, time is not a factor. Now, with that understanding, then the text does make sense. So, I'd like to take our attention to the book of Revelation chapter 12. We shall be reading from verse 1 to verse 6. And this is what it says. Now, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with the child, she cried out, in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. When we read this text, we encounter three symbols. One, the woman. Two, her son. And three, the great fiery red dragon. And I believe as we have read this text, several questions come to your mind. 
What do these great signs mean? Whom do they symbolize? Who is the woman? Who is Hassan? And what is that dragon that we are talking about? We will begin with the one that is easiest to identify. You know when I was in school and you were given an exam the teachers often always told us don't spend a lot of time with the harder questions. Cherry pick what is easy. And after you have done away with everything that is easy, then you come to the harder one. And I found that quite a good strategy. And I request to employ that today. So who is the easiest to identify among Amongst these three characters. The Bible is giving us opening up with great signs. And the Greek word that is used there is the word mega which means exceedingly great signs that are shown in the heavens. Now the signs represent or are symbols that represent something. So they are not themselves what they are. But they do represent something that the Bible wants us to understand. So if we are to interpret this, we need number one to look at the script scripture itself. And if we are to draw any interpretation, we need to go back to the text, the Bible, to interpret the scripture. So we will not use anything other than the Bible to explain or to try to interpret who these are. So who is the easiest to identify? The easiest one to identify is the dragon. Why the dragon? Because verse 9 tells us and I quote so the great dragon was cast out that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast with him cast out with him. The Bible is very explicit on who the fiery red dragon is. And he gives us two names. The devil and Satan. So there is no debate about him. And when you notice the features of his character, the Bible clearly explains what his ministry is. His ministry is to deceive the whole world. He is the king of deceit. Jesus in John chapter 8 verse 44 explains to us his nature. He first tells us he was a murderer from the beginning. Which possibly points to the, even the very first murder. Where Jesus gives us the indication that it was actually the devil behind Cain assassinating or killing Abel, his brother. Now he also tells us that he is the father of all liars. And that explains his ministry, deceit. So he, it's, his, his ministry is not what he died, what he specializes in is to deceive. Take note of that. Because today so many people 
have fallen prey to the deceit of Satan. We have fallen prey to his machinations to his designs to bring us to total destruction. We don't need to be ignorant about the wise of the enemy. We need to understand who he is from the very beginning. He is the chief of deceit. He is the architect of all deceit. And this deceit has repercussions. No wonder here he is labeled as red. Which is the color of blood. That again points to murder. Remember I told you Jesus has told us that he was a murderer from the beginning. In other words, he has never changed. That is his nature. Now, we also need to note a few things here. One, the seven heads which points to wisdom. So, he is wise in there are three things. He is wise in the manipulations that he does. So he's wise in everything that he does to be able to achieve his evil end. And then the seven horns. Sorry, the ten horns point to power. He does have a certain degree of power especially within the earthly realm and its operation. And the crowns point to authority. Now we will in detail discuss the dragon in chapter 13 and chapter 14. So I'm kindly requesting that for now having identified who the red fairy dragon is we move our attention to identify the next easiest. Number two the male child who is the male child? Here we have a clue. In verse 5, the Bible tells us that it is he who will rule all nations with an iron scepter, all with a rod of iron. Where do we find that? Psalm 2. This is what the Bible tells us. If we read verse 6, it says, Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Now listen to what he's saying. And then he goes on to say, ask of me and I will give you the heathen for thy inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. And thou shalt break them with the rod of iron and you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now this is a messianic psalm. And the Messiah here is Jesus Christ. And this psalm points at God establishing his kingdom. On the holy hill in Zion which is Jerusalem. And ruling with iron with a nine rod in verse 9 of Psalm 2 
tells us that he shall rule with absolute righteousness. So the reference we have here is of Jesus Christ. Yes. When we collaborate this with another messianic scripture, which is Isaiah 9, which tells us that unto us a son is born, unto us a child is given, and it says, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. He talks about his kingdom and says, Of his kingdom and peace there shall be no end. In other words, his kingdom is from everlasting to everlasting. So, without doubt, we now understand that the Son is Jesus Christ. Yeah, yes, Christ. Now we move to the third one. Who is this woman that is clothed with the sun and has the moon under her feet with a garland of 12 stars around her head? Who is this woman? Yani. Broadly speaking, we have three predominant schools of thought. And we will go through each one of them. The first one is the one that is heard by the Roman Catholics. The Roman Catholics say, and some, they say that this woman is Mary. Since she is the one who was the mother of Jesus. So having identified the child as Jesus, then the woman comes through as Mary. But we need to understand that what we are seeing here is a sign. So what we are seeing is symbolic. But again, Era. this theory also runs into problems. Era, because in verse 6, this is what the Bible tells us. Bible it says, Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Where is the problem, you may say? The problem is this. This account never happened to Mary. And it never will. So, Yes, it is a text that we read on the day that we assume that Mary was assumed into heaven. But these events never happened to Mary. Now there is the second school of thought which says, no, this is not an individual. And correct it says that this is actually a group of people. And they say that this symbolizes the church. So where do they draw this from? They draw this from the fact that the church is pictured as the bride of Christ. Therefore, it has the picture or the symbol of a woman. But also this theory runs into a problem. Why? Because the church did not produce Jesus Christ. It is the other way around. It is Jesus that produced the church. So this symbolism also does not fit the text. So we come to number three. 
to identify who this is. And I want us to look for the clues that identify this personality from scripture. The Bible tells us concerning this woman that she is clothed with the sun. The moon is under her feet with a garland of 12 stars on her head. Now we see the sun we see the moon and we see the 12 stars. Where have we seen this? Genesis chapter 37. Joseph Yusuf, the Bible gives us his account in that chapter. Bible He was a son of Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons. Jacob Joseph was his special one. Yusuf Joseph was his daddy. Yusuf And Joseph, the Bible tells us. Era Yusuf had a dream. And in this dream, he saw the sun, the moon, and the twelve stars, and the eleven stars. Bow down before him. When he told this dream to, to, to his brothers, Jacob had the dream. And Jacob correctly Interpreted, interpreted this dream and asked him shall your father and your mother and your brothers be exalted no shall you be exalted above your father mother and brothers Basically, what he meant was the sun represented Jacob, the moon represented Rachel, and the 11 stars were the brothers. So he is the 12th star. Basically, the 12 represent the 12 children of the tribe of Israel. So what we see here, which brings us to interpret who the woman is. The woman is Israel. Now you may ask me, uh, Pastor, I don't get this. Because did, did Israel give birth to Jesus? In a certain way, yes. This is what the Bible tells us. When Jesus was having this discussion with the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, Verse 22, he tells the woman, when they are discussing the issue of worship, in verse 22, he explains to the woman that salvation is of the Jews. Some versions say salvation is from the Jews. Paul Having understood this, paints the picture for us in Romans chapter 9 and verse 5. And he explains concerning the Jews. He says to them, is trust the human ancestry of Jesus Christ. So what that means, with the Gentiles, then access this salvation through faith in Jesus Christ by grace. And that is wonderful. The Bible also talks about this woman and says she had the sun around her. She was clothed in the sun. Which points us to Malachi. 
chapter 4 and verse 2 concerning another messianic promise which refers to Jesus Christ as the son of righteousness you see the son is the ruler of the day when the earth is rotating from the earthly perspective we say the sun has come up so what happens when the sun is up we don't see the moon the moon is under and when the earth rotates then you will see the moon but for you to get what is being pictured here of Israel or the woman clothed in the sun with the moon under her feet they are talking about the the ascendancy of Christ the revelation of Jesus Christ that will cover the nation of Israel and the glory before that day which is represented by the moon will be underfoot so Jesus yes. will be revealed as the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. Now I want us to focus on the events as they happen having established number one that the dragon is the devil Satan. And we have established that the Son is Jesus Christ. And the woman is Israel. The Bible goes back to narrate the events of the sign and what is happening. It says that this dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth and the intent was to devour the male child as soon as he was born. There's something very interesting here because what the Bible is taking us back He's taking us back all the way to Genesis chapter 3. When man had sinned and God begins to pronounce on man the consequences of their decision of eating of the forbidden fruit. And amongst after passing the consequences of their decision and action, God then makes a promise that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Now, the devil understood what this prophecy was about. And through the subsequent years, while Israel, who is the picture of the woman, is in labor pains, is waiting in eagerness to produce this male child. The devil, who is the dragon, is waiting for that child to be born so that he may kill him because he knew that this child would be a fulfillment of scripture which causes us to ponder on something you see the devil believes scripture and it is amazing it is baffling that we have people today people in church 
who read these scriptures and don't believe them. The, the devil down the chain, he knows. When Abel is born, he thinks, mm, wait a minute, this could be the one. Fulfilling what John Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 44. He moves Cain to kill Abel. Why? Because he believes this could be the one. Then Seth is born. He leaves that generation. He comes to the generation of Noah. Then you have the Nephilims coming in. And then God destroys that whole generation. Preserves. Noah. He shows up again. We see Noah drinking himself like a problem. And then again, his intention is to make sure that he destroys this major. He's just trying to say, could it be this one? And we move to Moses. When the children of Israel have now gone to Egypt, he folds his hand and is probably saying, now I have them. This is the perfect moment. The entire nation of Israel, all the descendants of Jacob, are right here. So he moves Pharaoh to command that every male child be killed. Why? Because he still believes this scripture. And we see even then he did not succeed. So down the years come the birth of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 2. The wise men come from the east. They come to Herod's palace. Herod the king. And then when they have brought the teachers of the Lord to explain, he finds out where Jesus was to be born. So he zeroes in on the area. So he tells the wise men, you go. Find him, then come back and tell me. So that I also go and worship. And we see that even that plan did not succeed. Because when the when they had finished seeing the Lord Jesus, an angel appeared to them. And they were warned. So they went another way. And then Mary and Joseph. Joseph was given a dream and he woke up and took Mary and they took the child to Egypt. Even there, in what looked like a random activity, God's plan was behind the scenes. The devil did not succeed. See, he, the devil will never have the final say in your life. God has the final say. And the Bible tells us that when the child was born, the one who was to rule over all nations with the rod of iron. The child was caught up to God and his throne. So what is happening here? We see the dragon, the one whom the Bible says had swept a third of the stars from the sky. With his tail. And you're saying, with his tail, what does that mean? You see, in Isaiah 9, that prophetic again book, verse 15. The Bible says, when you read it from the NIV version, it says the prophets 
who teach lies at the tail. So now it is actually a deceit that is the tale. So what the devil used to sweep the third of the stars is it. Liar from the beginning. That is what he uses to exercise his destructive work. Now this is what is happening. The Bible says, Bible and the child was caught up to God and his throne. I want you to focus what is happening. The child born and then caught up to God. And we are seeing, wait a minute, Linda, what just happened? But This text just condensed everything from the birth. We don't see the 30 years of Jesus growing up. We don't see the three and a half years of his ministry. We, we don't see his death talked about. Yet. We don't see his burial. We don't see his resurrection. But from birth, what do we see? The ascension. Everything is condensed in one sentence. What is this trying to say? How do you fit these events in? It, it goes back to what I told you. That this revelation is from heaven's perspective or heaven's point of view. So what we are seeing are events that happen. They are not showing us when they happen. Why? Because in, like I stated earlier, from the perspective of heaven, time is not a factor. So let's go on. Here we have a problem. And this is what I want you to see. The ascension of Jesus in heaven where he seated at the right hand of the Father. He had a purpose. The purpose was not for Jesus to escape his enemies. He was not escaping the dragon. No. When in Matthew 28, when he comes to the apostles, he tells them all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He had all authority over every principality, powers, over every demon. The Bible tells us that when he went into hell, he rendered captivity captive. He dismantled principalities and powers. That was before he ascended. So he could, this could not be. It could not be that he's caught up to try and escape the great serpent. So what is happening here? There is something that I need you to see. What is that aspect of the Lord that has to find deliverance, has to find escape from the attack of the serpent? And in order to do that, he has to be caught up to heaven. That aspect is the church. You see, through the New Testament, the church and Jesus Christ are regarded as one. So where do you get that? We have this account in Acts of the Apostles chapter 9. There is a man called Saul of Tarsus. He's passionate. He has zeal for Judaism. 
And when the believers in Jesus Christ begin multiplying, he makes it a personal assignment to find and execute anyone that believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we saw that as a result of his passion, Stephen was martyred. But not satisfied with what was happening, he went to the authorities and obtained letters to pursue those Christians that had escaped from Jerusalem. So on his way to Damascus, to pursue the Christians that were there, capture them and bring them before the courts of law and ensure that they are put to death. He has this divine encounter. And Jesus, yes. who appears to him, calls him and in verse 4, this is the account. He says, Saul, 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 why are you persecuting me? What does he say? It's not saying, why are you persecuting my church? He's saying, why are you persecuting me? So, by Paul persecuting the church, Paul was actually persecuting Jesus himself. Jesus is saying, that is me. And you get that picture now. Now this soul, later turned to Paul, who is converted, writes the letter to the church in Corinth. In the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 12 and verse 12, this is what Paul has to say. He says, for as the body is one and has many members of that one body, being many, a one body. So also is Christ. In other words, the church and the Lord are together called the body of Christ. So what is happening here? For the, for the child to be caught up, he is actually pointing to what we call the second resurrection, the first, the second resurrection, which many of us call the rapture. So they, it uses the same word, caught up. Some version use the word snatched. Basically, what is happening here is that the church will be snatched up away from the latter period of the great tribulation. Praise be to God. And that is wonderful news to you mm -hmm. and I that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, where does that place you and I? There is something to look at here. We are seeing an unveiling of events that on one hand seem unplanned. Yet when you look at it in detail, you are going to see that all these are intricately woven together. And they point to the existence of a plan. And this is God's plan. So when he says for the plans, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, there are plans for good and not for evil. Many of us just look at the scripture and say, what, are, what is it talking about? Yeah, everybody has a plan. 
I want you to understand when God says I have a plan for your life it is a cause for celebration because that is the overaching plan when Paul understood that he comes back to us in Romans 8.28 and he says now we know that all things work together for good for them that love the Lord and accord according to his purpose. That is wonderful news. Because if God has called you, the Bible tells us those that he phoned you, he called. And those that he called, he justified. And those that he justified, he glorified. And look at this. God just doesn't call you. He has a plan for your life. And that plan is a plan that ends with glory. It is a plan that ends with power and majesty. It is not a plan that just hangs around. It is a plan for good. That plan involves Israel. That plan involves the church. That plan involves you and I because we as a church. So I want you to see yourself in the way God sees you. Now let me speak to that somebody who is not the part of the body of Christ. How do you become the body of the part of the body of Christ. The Bible says he came unto his own. His own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God. Now this is an amazing scripture. You see, we have heard this said time and again. Everyone is a child of God. You don't have the right to call yourself a child of God until you have received the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it is those that received you that God gave the power to be called the children of God. So if you have not yet received him right now, I want to tell you God has a plan and you can be part of this plan. It begins by you becoming a child of God. So you have never received Jesus in your life. This is your moment. I want you to say these words from the bottom of your heart. This is the time to go before God. Acknowledge your sin. Not your sins. Uh, your sin nature. Ask him to come in your life. Ask him to bring his light. Ask him to come and bring his salvation. Ask him to fill you with his Holy Spirit. And that very moment, your life will be changed. Say the Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, here I am. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior in my life. Lord Jesus you died to save me you died to save sinners like me forgive me Lord I believe that you rose from the dead and therefore I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit and empower me to live this life according to this plan that you have designed for my life Help me, Lord, that from this day forward I live my life not for things but for you. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. 
I'm going to pray with you. And I'm going to pray for that one that is backslidden. I'm going to pray for that one that is hopeless. The, that one that is asking, Lord, what is there for me? God has a plan for you. And today, by His Spirit, the connection will be made. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for these, your people, those that have committed their lives to you, Lord, as the Savior and the Lord of their lives. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you rest mightily upon their lives. Open the eyes of their understanding. Guide and lead them, Lord, in this way of truth. For the Bible declares that the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. I pray, Lord, that you order their footsteps. King of glory, even for that one that needs you to intervene in their affairs of their lives in a special way be it death be it sickness be it disease be it depression be it any kind of oppression of the enemy in the name of Jesus Christ the son of the living God I thank you Lord that right now your healing power your plan is being made unveiled before them. And they are rising up in glory, in majesty, and in power to live the kind of life that you, my Lord Jesus, died to ensure that they live. Therefore, I thank you for that also. I thank you for the testimonies that are coming. The glorified and magnified King of glory. In the matchless and wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. There is that number on your screen. If you have a testimony of what God is doing in your life, please pick up that phone and call. Would like to celebrate what God is doing in your life. We want to give glory and honor and praise to God for the wonderful things He's done. So until we meet again, this is Dominion Church saying, God richly bless you. Shalom. Mirembe.